Let me tell you about a book called Mother of Learning. Mother of Learning is one of my favorite novels, period. And today, I wanted to ask the question, why? Why is this book so good? And I don't want to waste your time, so it boils down to this. Mother of Learning embodies this idea of character growth, both of its characters and their abilities. It's a power fantasy that feels satisfying to read. Each chapter feels like a discovery and is something new and interesting to explore. However, before I dive too deep into it, what is Mother of Learning anyway? Mother of Learning is a book that started off on Fiction Press. And if you don't know what Fiction Press is, it's a website where you can publish your writing for free for others to read. So Mother of Learning is free to read right now, and I've linked the story down in the description below. So Fiction Press is similar to Wattpad and Archive of our own, but let's face it, the problem with these websites is the writing is mostly amateur. There's nothing wrong with that, I mean I highly encourage anyone to write, and everyone starts off as an amateur, and that's fine. Although I did like reading on Wattpad once, as I grew older and read more books, I found that I didn't like most of the stories I found on there. But Mother of Learning, this story stayed with me throughout my childhood, and to this day, I can still say this book is as enchanting and awesome as it was when I first read it. The book Mother of Learning has been eight years in the making, and it is still ongoing. To date, this book has 768,372 words, and 100 chapters, and it still isn't done, although it is coming to a close very soon. To give you an idea of how large Mother of Learning really is, Lord of the Rings is 455,125 words long. Order of the Phoenix is 257,154 words long. 
But to be honest with you, that really doesn't mean anything. A book could be 1 million words and still be absolute rubbish. But Mother of Learning isn't. It's so carefully crafted because the author made a commitment to write this book as a hobby. Almost every month, releasing a chapter of around 10,000 words. And I've got to applaud the author here. To do this on the side and to persist through eight years of writing this book, that is dedication that I can truly admire. His one book was inspiration for me for many years. And this was what inspired that I aspired to write. I wanted to create something this complex, this beautiful. In fact, I probably wouldn't have started this channel without this book because I wanted to make something as grand as this to show others what I liked, though I never felt qualified to cover this book. But I wanted to do it justice today. I have talked to the author online, but <laughs> I was crazy back then. And he was really ple pleasant to talk to. He's someone who's really passionate about what he does and is kind enough to talk to you. Anyway, if it wasn't obvious already, I'm going to spoil the plot, but I personally, I personally like always ignore spoiler warnings anyway. My philosophy is if a story can't stand on its own without the mystery of the plot, it wasn't that great in the first place. So what is Mother of Learning about? So Mother of Learning is about this student named Zorian who is attending this magical academy and he's stuck in a time loop, repeating the same month like the movie Groundhog Day again and again. At the end of each month, Sayoria, the major city Zorian lives in, is invaded by a horde of creatures and a lich named Quatach Ichil and his followers from Alkan Ubasa, a foreign country, and the month is restarted. Apologies, I probably mangled all the names, but <laughs> which is nothing new. I mean, a lot of movies use similar premises. For example, Source Code and Edge of Tomorrow, which is based on the manga All You Need Is Kill. It's this idea of perfection, repeating the same thing again and again, and being able to undo mistakes. However, I feel like the time loop in Mother of Learning serves more as a tool of discovery than anything else, which makes it slightly different. There's not as much trial and error as there is what if Zorian took a different approach, resulting in a completely different outcome and a new perspective, thus allowing the characters to be fleshed out so much more. And that's where the colossal word count is such an advantage. Nobody 103 has this minute attention to detail and descriptions and expands upon the characters and the world, bringing it to life. But let's not get sidetracked. Well, because I might as well spoil the rest of the plot anyway. So how is Zorian brought into the time loop anyway? Well, Zorian, the protagonist, which from which this story is told from, um, isn't the first time traveler. His classmate at the Magical Academy, Zack, is, who has already been repeating the same month for a decade or so. Zorian is only brought into the time loop now because his soul is combined with Zack's after the, quat the necromancer Quatach Ichil attacks both of them. So Zorian is brought along in the time loop. They eventually discover that there's a third time traveler who's traveling with them, who they name as Red Robe, because spoilers, he always wears a red robe. And he attacks Zack and Zorian. Uh, Zorian doesn't let Zack know he's in the time loop, uh, because he's afraid he'll be attacked by Red Robe or the Lich Quatach Ichil's followers. So he goes into hiding and pretend he, pretends he doesn't know anything about the time loop. So what follows is probably the best part of the book, where Zorian uses the time loop to learn, hence the title Mother of Learning, using it to advance his magical knowledge and skills for a few years. And this part is fully fleshed out and I love it. 
let me revisit that idea of growth, at this, which I uh, talked about at the start. What do I mean when I'm talking about growth? Well, Mother of Learning reminds me of Spirit Realm, Wudong Qian Kung, and uh, Against the Gods, where growth is everything. I like overpowered characters, but I feel like they need to earn their power. With everything you do in a book or movie, you need to convince the audience. Having an overpowered character from square one just doesn't feel satisfying, because it feels like they didn't do anything to deserve that power. And this growth in Mother of Learning fuels the story, not only through his skills, but developing relationships with others. Although every character forgets Zorian at the end of the month, uh, end of each month, it's almost as if there's something uh, in their subconscious that still remembers him. And it's these relationships that form over these continued encounters, because Zorian knows so much about uh, them from talking to them in previous restarts that he, in effect, develops this connection with them. This is illustrated most distinctly and infamously along, amongst people who have read Mother of Learning through a teacher at the academy called Zvim. And he's Zorian's mental teacher, infamous for being tough on his students. So the first few times Zorian goes to Zvim, he fails miserably in these almost impossible manner shaping exercises Zvim asks him to do. However, Zorian persists through each of these restarts uh, for almost two years, and each time he accomplishes one of the tasks, uh, Zvim asks him to do something even more difficult. There's this growing relationship between them, and finally, when Zorian accomplishes all the tasks Zvim sets him to do, even impressing Zvim, who's basically a master of magic, and Zvim asks him if he's truly Zorian, uh, and accepts Zorian uh, as a time traveler. And you get this huge sense of accomplishment along with Zorian, having completed this journey with him. And I wouldn't really say that uh, Zorian develops as a character, although the novel has these parts where he reflects upon how he has become such a different person. That's because in the first five-ish chapters, he's really unsociable, and then when he realizes the time loop is a thing, he suddenly does this switch to this talkative and social character. And I feel like there could have been a better transition to show that growth more clearly. There's also mind-reading spiders, which are called Arania, and are this secret, secretive uh, civilization that speak through tel tel telepathy, uh, who are the ones who teach Zorian mind magic, which is really creative. I love the thought put into these other races and how they exist, and how this affects how they operate. For example, they use webcraft, instead carving their spell formula onto webs, instead of materials, like normal humans in the book. However, on with the story. I'm going to skip over a few details because otherwise we'd be here forever. And if you want, I can do another video on just the plot. But Zack finds out that Zorian is in the time loop, and he punches Zorian for not trying to contact him. So the two of them start cooperating to find out about the time loop, gaining a ton of advanced spells, such as simul sim Simulacrum, which basically means uh, you can create a clone of yourself. They also find that Red Robe used mind magic on Zack, and Red Robe somehow managed to join the loop. Uh, through their investigations, they find that the time loop was an agreement done by Zack with an angel to stop the release of a primordial, which is this evil godlike being, which the invaders to the city are trying to release. The entire world which the time loop is in is actually a copy of the real world. Now, if this doesn't make too much sense, I apologize. That's actually my fault. In summary, the time loop was activated to stop an evil god rising, and Zack was sent into the time loop to become strong enough to go back to reality to stop the release of this evil god. 
And I'll simplify this next part because the full explanation is kind of confusing. So eventually, Zack and Zorian find out that the only way to escape the time loop is through the evil god, or slash primordial's, prison. This is because this prison exists both in the real world and this copy of a world. So it's kind of a gate between reality and this copy of a world. And I'm, I'm actually kind of iffy about this as well. But only Zack and Zorian end up escaping. So now they're back in reality, Red Robe appears and negotiates a truce until the end of the month, uh, threatening to de detonate uh, wraith bombs if Zack or Zorian attacks him or the invaders, thus giving him time to prepare. So the current chapter is actually left on a precipice with the final battle between the two forces, one trying to free the primordial and one trying to stop them. And that's it. Believe me, that was the short summary. <laughs> I skipped a lot. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about what I really liked about Mother of Learning because I don't generally read books again, but I liked this so much that I've read it about four times over the years. So something I really like about Mother of Learning is the magic system. The magic system actually makes sense to some degree. As my older brother once said, any good magic system, or if I extend that out even further, fantasy world must have a set of rules that it follows. There's your innate uh, mana capacity uh, in Mother of Learning, how much mana or magic you have, and then there's mana shaping, which is the ability to control your mana. Uh, to use a spell or mana, you need to have the mana and also be skilled enough at shaping that mana. And that's how the, the uh, system in uh, Mother of Learning works. There's also different branches of magic, such as alteration, mind magic, blood magic, shift magic, spell formula, which all have their separate rules and are, that are consistent when they operate on a set of rules with an underlying basis. It is more realistic, not just because a character, uh, and not just because a character feels like it, they, that feels like it, that they can cast this spell. And the magic system feels like a part of the world. For example, the magic missile and shield spell. As Chiron, uh, a professional mage and their battle uh, instructor says, in its simplest form, magic missile takes the form of a shining bolt of force that travels in a straight line, delivering concussive blasts of force to whatever it impacts. This variant is often called the smasher. You can use animation magic to make it home in on a target. You can sharpen it into a point that will pierce things instead of batter them, or a line to cut them, the piercer and cutter respectively. You can fire multiple missiles instead of one, a swarm even, if you have the reserves and skill to pull it off. And of course, you can make the projectile invisible. It really feels as if this magic has been integrated in as part of the world. And Chiron even states, a perfectly cast force spell is completely transparent. The light show you usually see is magical le leakage resulting from an imperfect spell boundary. That is, putting his own take on why magic usually shines. The author of this novel, Nobody 103, takes this stereotype of bright blasts of magic and twists it around saying that the glow is actually a mistake. It's only there because the spell is actually cast imperfectly. And that's what I really love about it. The same thing can be seen with a shield spell, with variants such as having multiple layers, creating interlocking hexagonal panels for the shield so only one um, hexagon breaks instead of the entire shield when the shield is compromised. And it's nobody 103 asking himself, what would happen if these spells were real? Well, there would be research on these spells, on how to improve them, to create variants of these spells, to integrate their use in daily life. And the other thing I really like about 
it is the details of the setting. As I said before, everything in the world feels really fleshed out. Even with a massive cast, Nobody 103 takes the time to visit each of the characters in their separate arcs. For example, Kiriel, Kiriel, uh, Zorian's little sister, always pests Zorian at the start of each restart. But then Zorian discovers it's because she wants to learn magic too, and her mother is preventing her from doing so. So she pests Zorian every restart, hoping to go to the academy with him. And you've got characters such as Rain, who is a wolf shifter. And on a whim, Zorian decides to contact Rain in one of the restarts. And whereas before she's just a classmate, we discover that she's been exiled from her clan as she threatens the legitimacy of the male heir to the clan. And this would never have happened uh, without the time loop. And that's what I mean when I say the time loop is used as this tool of discovery to flesh out and explore these characters more fully. I won't say too much about the politics because after four reads of Mother of Learning, I still don't understand it. I mean, there was something about a war and splinter states and this disease called the weeping, but I was more just waiting for the action. <laughs> there's so much lore in, uh, around this book and that there's even a wiki for Mother of Learning. And admittedly, it's not that in depth, but still. Now, my criticisms of this novel, and I have a lot. Although I really like this novel, I did have a few criticisms with it. And they're not really big things, but I just wish that they would be fixed. So my biggest criticism is kind of ironic because Mother of Learning skips too much, despite having so many words. Look, I was okay with the first 50 chapters, especially with the Zvim arc. That was some of the best writing I have ever seen. And it feels like that in the rush to finish this book, especially towards the later chapters, a lot of events are just assumed to have happened without ever appearing in the book. The most prominent example of this is just like that, another five restarts passed. Like, no, no, no. I mean, that is so bad. I'm sorry, but the thing that makes Mother of Learning so great is the details that we, we as the audience are understanding these things, these new things with Zorian. Even when there's, they're just working on making golems or just talking to each other and building relationships, the story is so fascinating. And the fact that five months were just skipped uh, is horrible. All that description, that potential story and world building, just imagining what was missed in between makes me cry. And this happens so often in the later chapters where Zorian or Zack would just do things or get spells outside of the book. There would just be a time skip and I hate it because I want to see more of this world. I want to understand how these spells works, work and how did they get there? It's these small moments of resting, calm and peace in which relationships are developed and world building occurs. But time skips throw all of that into the trash. Another example of this is this ectoplasmic thread spell. And there's no explanation of how it works. There's no explanation of where Zorian got the spell. Uh, he just suddenly gets this spell at, in the middle of one chapter. And there's no explanation of the underlying basis behind it. He just suddenly has it just because. Because of that, there's no limits to this spell because no rules define ectoplasmic threads. He can just cast it because he wants to, which just breaks the idea that a magic system needs rules. And this happens for pretty much every spell Zorian gets in the last 50 chapters. We have no clue how it works and he just has this floating laser disc and we're just supposed to know it works. And that's for every spell in his entire arsenal. Do you know what would be so much more powerful? Having a really crap laser disc spell that does nothing in the beginning and seeing Zorian practice it, develop it from the basics understand that it's many mod modified force spells 
that instead of pushing, are so focused that they start to cut objects. Knowing how much mana it consumes, that it needs to be continuously casted, so it can't be used in the long term. So there's some strategy behind that. And then developing that with multiple variants which are more powerful, experimenting with how it works, and having the reader along for the ride. That's what makes a magic ability fantastic. You don't need to explain everything to a reader, but going that extra mile, like you did for a magic missile, makes it so much more believable and gets the reader involved. Ectoplasmic threads as a spell just sucks. Like the, this novel shined the most when we were learning about the spells and how they worked, how the character obtained them, the history behind them, what does it take to cast them? And suddenly he just got the spell behind the reader's back, just randomly. Just what? And I have a serious grudge against this spell, I'm, I'm not even kidding. So less time skips and just show us the journey to these abilities, because that's what gives life to them. And I do feel like this book started losing steam towards the end because there were just too many characters and they all blend into this one overall personality. And a lot of the characters lost what makes them unique. Especially Zvim, who's supposed to be this super strict teacher. And he doesn't have to feel like a super strict teacher. He just or he doesn't feel like a super strict teacher anymore in the final 50 chapters. He just follows Zack and Zorian. He's an archmage. At least I feel like he should have kept that strict demeanor about him. Now, please don't take this personally. The fact that you, the author, even wrote this book is a huge achievement in itself. And I have nothing but admiration for you. It's um, inhuman to expect you to appeal to everyone, and these are just some things that I thought could be improved. My next criticism is there are so many loose ends. For example, Zack saying he would teach Zorian medical magic, Zack trying to learn invisible magic missile, which is just forgotten about, Rainy and Tanami, their plot threads just being left hanging, and the hundred eyes uh, inside the, the caverns. By themselves, this is, they are not huge issues, but the scale of mother of learning is enormous. But these loose threads that they never come back to add up. It feels like Nobody 103 opened up all this potential plot, and you can really see where it could have led, but the next chapter just forgets it entirely. By far the biggest offender in this category is this last arc, which is from about chapter 85 to 91, where Tyven cries about how she wants to get out of the time loop and to be rescued alongside Zack and Zorian. And Zorian promises that he will rescue Tyven. And then she dies, and it's all forgotten. She survived five restarts with a temporary marker, allowing her to be a part of the time loop for a short while. And she wanted to get out alive, but she just dies. And nothing is said about any of that. That's a huge plot thread that feel, felt like it was dropped for no reason. That all these other characters like, like Alanik and Zvim were all killed despite going through five restarts. Perhaps because I'm actually attached to Tyven and her crying and then just dying felt really bad. Good job by the way for getting me attached to Tyven though. <laughs> I just think that there are a lot of plot threads, such as Rainy, Tsunami, and others that will not be wrapped up neatly at the end, even though Zorian says he's going to thank them somehow for helping him in the time loop. Which brings me to my next point, which is that the final restart, I, which is reality, sucks. This is more of a personal opinion, but everything goes up in flames. Zack is sick. Red Robe is still alive, the invasion is in full swing, when they get out of the time loop. And some part of me just wishes that once Zorian and Zack had finally escaped the time loop, they could do everything. Just the perfect reality run, like transferring all their knowledge into reality to beat absolutely everything and to have this flawless 
run. Otherwise, how are we going to fulfill all the promises to thank everyone? Because everyone is going to die in the final battle. Outside of a total resurrection of all the characters like Tyson and Chiron, it feels like Mother of Learning is going to have a very miserable ending, where a lot of the good guys are dead, having sacrificed themselves for the greater good. And although sappy, I do like happy endings, and I think that a sad ending does ruin a good movie or book, unless it actually has some philosophical meaning. Okay, so final two criticisms. The problem with Mother of Learning is that Zorian and Zack are way too strong, even if they are within the time loop. Zorian only had something like 6 years in the time loop, and Zack has something like 20 or 30, I can't really remember the exact number. But the level of power that they display just doesn't make any sense. I know that they say that Zorian and Zack can spend their money recklessly because it comes back every restart. But even then, Zorian only had something like 6 years to learn magic, and I'm somehow supposed to believe that he's better than any professional mage who is about 5 times older than him. Sure, he may have access to better resources and be under pressure, but surely if he could display this level of mastery within 6 years, anyone outside the time loop should be able to do a lot better than him in something like 12. And a lot of people in the book are much older than him. The same goes for Zack. Sure, the angels doubled his mana reserves, but people who are 50 years old should still be much stronger than him. I don't get how he's better than every single adult. 20 years is a boost, but it's not that much. Everyone else has just been trained has been training just as much, but they're nowhere near Zack and Zorian for some reason. Surely a professional battle mage such as Chiron has the advantage of age and experience on them and should still be way better than them. Now my final crit criticism is that Kotach Ichio, the lich and main villain who pretty much the entire book uh, throughout the pretty much the entire book becomes a joke when he talks to the main characters in chapter 81. Now this villain was the fear of the main characters and he just suddenly decides to talk to them, which I feel belittles his character up to this point. It just seems so out of character to me that they would suddenly cooperate with the Lich or the Lich would cooperate with them, but in the end it's not really a big issue. Overall, Mother of Learning is a fantastic novel that I think you should read, and any criticisms that I have are far outweighed by how much I love this novel. Nobody 103 you have made something beautiful, and I really love what you did. And that's about it. So on to some video recommendations uh, that I really liked for today. So my first video, video recommendation is Scary Truths About the Animation Industry by A Bit Frank. And even though she says that she's doing less animation for this episode, it's so good. I really, really, really like her art style. It looks so pretty. and. Her voice is so cute. You shouldn't say that. She is a professional animator, so it makes sense. But yeah, I suggested this video because not only is it pretty, she has a really unique aesthetic, which I fell in love with, but it's also enlightening. In this video, she shared her own experience in the animation industry of exploitation and extortion and that being an individual is actually pretty nice because you have creative say over your work. And that was something that really resonated with me because I like making what I like. If I wasn't making what I like, I wouldn't be making anything. And I think I really took that for granted. I don't animate or draw and I don't really intend to in the future because it's so time consuming. Although I really like artwork it's just not the thing for me. But I watch guides on how to draw and animate all the same because they're fun to watch and creative, and especially this video. Okay, on to the next one, talking about a really cute voice, Sundere voice meme by Kagi's Corner. Hello? Okay, okay, it's working. Um, My voice usually isn't like this. 
I actually do not know where I found this, but it's really cute and I like it. This voice acting is cute and I love it. It's a little bit of fun and she actually speaks proper Japanese. That is as far as I can tell as a wee. She's a voice actress, which explains why she's so amazing. I love her voice. She just sounds like she's straight from an anime, which just goes to show how talented she is. So I advise you to go have a look. The next video recommendation is by Chris Davis and is a critique of Neo, and it covers the entire game. It's a two hour long review, and I didn't actually intend to sit down and watch all of it, but I did, even though it was at two times speed, to help me decide if I was going to buy Neo. And what I really like about his reviews are they're so comprehensive. He covered the entire story, the gameplay elements, the boss fights, and I eventually decided not to buy Neo, but I can admire the effort he puts into his reviews. Now the final recommendation for today is an animation to music, which is I Adore Her by Pansy Shot, and that's actually their channel name. And this is an animation of Please Don't Bully Me, Nagatoro-san. And just a note, I really love the manga, maybe because I'm a submissive male. Coincidentally, did you know that the author of this manga has done a lot of hentai manga as well, which is actually some pretty good stuff, I believe. Anyway, this is a manga animation, which is pretty incredible. If you have a look at the behind the scenes video, Tansu Shot had to redraw all the missing parts of Nagatoro by hand and then animate them and it syncs so well to the music. This is crazy creative and I really like it. Now that's all my video recommendations for today. By the way, this channel just hit 71 subscribers, which is kind of crazy now that I think about it. So thank you very much, but I continue what I was doing either way. <laughs> thank you for being here. You are my lifeblood. Book Nyan, out.